Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Boone's Ferry. My name is Matis. I'm the preaching teaching pastor here. And uh, if I didn't get to meet you during the meet and greet time, then um, I'd love to meet you after church. I do hang out for a while. I was just sitting with someone talking about how, um, you know, extroverts probably like the greeting time more than introverts. And uh, even though my parents were missionaries in Germany for 20 plus years, the thing that they liked the least about church something that doesn't happen in German churches is the greeting time. <laughs> they did not enjoy having to turn around and shake hands. And uh, I think some of the reason for that was that it felt forced, but I don't feel like it feels that way at Boone's Ferry. We actually really hang out and say hi, and you get an opportunity. It's a very well, warm welcome, and I really enjoy it myself. And I don't think just because I'm an extrovert, I think it's actually a really good and biblical thing to do, to welcome each other as God welcomed us in Christ. Um, so I want to do a couple things. I want to announce something that I've been announcing for a while, but is now at its most urgent. If you've been with us the last couple weeks, you know that we have a Bible reading challenge that we're starting. That Bible reading challenge is different than you might expect, different in a couple ways. Uh, for one, it's not a chronological read-through or a straight read-through. You don't just go from Genesis to Exodus, Leviticus. You're actually reading, to begin with, Psalm 119. And then that's for two days on the 12th and 13th. That starts tomorrow, and you have two days to read all of Psalm 19. And then on the 14th and 15th, you're reading Genesis 1 through 3 and John 1 through 3. And you think, wow, why Genesis and John? Well, if you notice, Genesis 1 begins with in the beginning, and John 1 also begins with in the beginning. And so uh, the person that put this word to, uh, this, uh, together, this is based on to the word 2022. So we've adapted it. Theirs was nine months. Ours is going to be about 16 months. We feel like a more reasonable long-term pace will lead to less burnout, less pressure, and less of the most negative thing, I think, that can happen with a Bible challenge, which you get behind and start feeling condemned rather than uh, excited about being in the Word. All we are trying to do as a leadership team is help you uh, be someone who reads the Bible regularly and that you would be in a stream of doing that, not to pressure you, not to force you, or to guilt trip you if you don't. And so I might say, you know, um, you could join us for a time and just commit. I will, I'll start with Genesis and see where I go. You could say, I'm going to commit to all 16 months. But no matter what, uh, in, instead of feeling like, oh, man, I'm, I'm a bad Christian. I haven't been reading through the Bible. The, the feeling that we hope this um, brings about is a desire to get closer with Jesus through his word, through engaging with his word. And so maybe on a day that you miss or two days or you fall a little bit behind, you start longing to be close with him again and pursuing him in relationship through his word rather than feeling guilty that you haven't. Um, I don't mean to be negative or too negative, but it's my guess. Uh, it's from a personal experience, nearly 15 years now of being a pastor, that the majority of Christians, even in conservative evangelical churches, don't read the Bible regularly and are constantly thinking, I should, I should. And uh, I don't train anywhere near as much as I used to in football years either. And I think part of that is that there's structure missing for that. You know, back in the day, I just had to go work out. I was part of a football team. Well, now you're part of a church where you don't have to do this, but you have some structure. You've got a program. You can join us in it. And we're hoping that we become a Bible uh, reading culture kind of church where maybe you get together and you don't just talk about what's going on in the NFL or what new thing happened that's interesting or have in common, but you actually talk about what you learned about from the life of David as you're reading through it together. It gives you some common ground to stand on if you're doing this Bible reading challenge. I also want to show you where on the website you can actually find this. So you see our front page here. If you go to resources, all the way down to the bottom tab of resources, you'll see Word Like Fire. If you clicked on this, you would go to the next slide, which you'll see the logo. And if you go to the next slide, it's the actual PDF of the reading program. And you can print it out there. We've got a couple more of these as you walk out on the banister on your left near the front door. If you want these actual hard copy ones, these are printed on a heavier card stock, so they're kind of nice. But you might want a foldable one, or you might just want to be able to print one out. Like I said last week, I'm really looking forward to this checking the boxes. I'm looking forward to I've never read through the Bible with this kind of plan. I think it's going to be really powerful. Uh, instead of spending three-fourths of our year or so in the Old Testament, we're going to be reading the Old Testament and its complementary teaching in the New Testament. I think it's going to be powerful. I think it's going to be really good. Just as an example, you read through Hebrews. Uh, while you're reading through Leviticus for obvious reasons, because Hebrews is all about that one time, once for all sacrifice. It makes Leviticus so much more powerful to know it's all about the cross. So I want to invite you into that. Uh, one more thing I want to show you on the website. If you go again to resources and go to the last front, uh, second from the bottom uh, tab, you'll see there's a prayer forum that we're developing. This is still in its developmental uh, phase, so it's still working, but we might have to figure out... Um, 
whether it works just for us. Now, if you had clicked on prayer form, you wouldn't have seen this page. You would have seen a page that's requesting you uh, to become part of it. So you can hit that and follow the link, and then we will approve you if you're part of our church, which means this is a private church-wide prayer page. You're only uh, going to be part of it if you get approved. Um, so this one is not open to the public. And uh, what we're hoping will happen is as we read through the Bible together as a church, um, there's something that happens when you engage with God's Word that stokes your prayer life, stokes your desire to pray for others, to, to know what's going on in their life, to be able to pray for them. And this is kind of a cool tool where we can be putting prayer requests and praises down in comments during the week. You can become notified on your phone or on your email that, hey, there's a new prayer request. And maybe this person that you're not in a small group with and you don't regularly hang out and only see on church on Sundays is saying, hey, I'm sick, my family's sick, it's been a rough week, will you pray for me? And then you can pray for them. A second thing that we're developing as well is that this would be a comment forum, not just a prayer forum. So maybe you learn something as you're reading through Genesis that you really desire to share, kind of a devotional comment. You could throw that up here too as an encouragement to the congregation. I think there's a lot of wisdom in our church. In fact, as I was worshiping with you guys in the back, I was looking around and seeing young and old and thinking, I'm about to go up there and teach them and they're here in part to listen to me, and it was, it was humbling. I know that some of you are more mature in your faith, know the scriptures better than I do, have been walking with the Lord for longer than I am, and yet God has me teaching. So there's something really humbling about that, but I wouldn't uh, for one second think that you guys don't have things to teach me, and I can't wait to hear a prayer request, be praying for them, the elders will be praying for them, and uh, we're hoping that this, again, stirs our desire and encourages you and lifts you up to uh, be reading God's word more often and be in prayer and involved in prayer for others as well. So that's my only real announcement. <coughs> I guess I, I might as well say our discipleship communities have started up again. Those are small groups that where we eat together on Wednesday nights, we study God's word. So just this last Wednesday night, we studied what I'm about to preach on in Daniel. Uh, you're very much welcome to join any one of those at any time. Uh, you don't even have to email. You can show up at one of the houses. I lead one. Drew Camp leads one in his house. And we're going to be developing more here coming in the fall and uh, early winter. Um, I did think, you know, I, I want to be honest, this is going to sound bad, but I barely even noticed that it was September, September 11th today until I looked at the news feed. And it's not because I don't care about first responders or don't, because I don't care about our nation. I think it's because it's been 20 years. It's been 20 years since September 11th. I, that shocked me when I, when I saw it. And a lot has happened in those 20 years. I don't think relationships between um, our culture and society and the police and first responders were necessarily great even back in the early 2000s, but they're particularly bad now these days. And as a Christian and as a pastor, I think I know at least one of the reasons why is a loss of the value of authority and a negative relationship to authority, anyone in authority, especially those who are uh, law enforcement and, and those who actually enforce legal things. If a nation begins to have a broken relationship to authority, I think you can probably primarily point back to the idea of broken relationships with fathers and mothers. So a broken relationship to the main authority in your nuclear family will lead to a broken relationship in, um, in relationship to other authorities as well. And I would like to pray today on September 11th, uh, not just for the victims and all the tragedy that's happened and for the safety of our nation, but in particular to first responders and law enforcement and for that wound that seems to be, I, when I think of police, when I think of firefighters, I have nothing but positive feelings. And that doesn't mean that I've always been treated perfectly. I, think, I know there's human beings, but um, I don't know what we're going to do as a society, especially in suburbs, especially as a father of six, if the trust between the regular populace and you know, the average citizen and our first responders and law enforcement keeps degrading, uh, who is going to keep us safe? Who is actually going to enforce law and order? I don't want to live in the time of the judges or a time of anarchy. I don't know that you do either. So I think praying for this is good. So let's bow our heads together and uh, with one voice lift up uh, concerns around September 11th. Lord God, we love our nation and we are grateful that you've placed us here. It's not a perfect nation. Uh, there have been many sinful things in our history, but it is a nation of freedom, a nation founded on the liberties and freedoms that we see your word teaching that a society should have, a nation intended to be founded on the righteous rules that you lay out uh, that we can at least in principle employ in governing. 
And so we love our nation. We do not want to see it be destroyed. We want to seek the peace and welfare of the cities of our nation. We want to be patriotic in that way. We know that we are children of another kingdom first, far before we are um, citizens of this nation. But that doesn't mean that we're not ambassadors of the kingdom and want the very best for the nation that we live in. And one of the problems, Lord, that we see is the broken relationship between uh, average citizens and law enforcement and authorities and first responders. And so we pray not only that you would um, grant comfort today to those who have lost people in tragic terrorist attacks like 9-11, but that you would also heal the wound uh, that I think has happened probably primarily between fathers and sons, and that you would heal the breach and that there would be a returning for, from father to son and son to father, like you talked about John the Baptist ministry would be and ultimately through Jesus. We pray that you would bring revival and that there would be healing and that there would be great prosperity for our nation that happens as a result of the humbling revival and repentance that you bring, uh, the very thing that we become hopeful and more hopeful as we see you work that very thing thing in Nebuchadnezzar's life in Daniel chapter 4. Thank you for this time. Thank you for these listening ears and for these Christians that you're shaping into the likeness of Christ and for the humbling task that you've given me to teach your word. I pray that I'd get out of the way and that your Holy Spirit would speak powerfully now. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you a question that I'm, I don't know how. I'm positive, though, that it's going to connect with you. Do you know you need to change in some way? If you're married, there's at least one person that's been telling you <laughs> that you need to change. And she has not been wrong yet about the ways that I need to change when she is prayerful about it and when she's careful. Christine is a good barometer of my relationship to God. If she's constantly telling me I need to change something, something must be wrong. But I'm talking about deeper than just someone else can witness. I'm talking about in your soul. Do you know that you need to make a change? And maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe it's not so much that you need to make a change, but you realize that there's something about you that is fundamentally different than what you see in God's word about Jesus' character and about God's character. And, and so maybe the wrong question is whether you need to make a change, but rather you realize you need to be changed. And I don't mean you change some behavior, but I mean that on the inside, you would be fundamentally changed. Maybe you have desires that you know lead to sinful actions or sinful thoughts. And they can be all kinds of different things. You cave to fear rather than being strong in faith or you, you give in to this particular pleasure or this desire rather than being pure. Whatever it is, <coughs> if you're being honest with yourself, you can't deny that the desire exists. And so part of you realizes, I want the desire to change. I want to stop desiring this wrong thing. And you want to be changed. The Bible actually calls this transformation. It's a far greater transformation than what happens from a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's a, it's a fundamental, supernatural, spiritual interchange in human beings. And it's something the Bible promises is a ministry of the Holy Spirit in his people. And yet, where are you at in your hope? Maybe those very same people in your life that are saying that you need to change. Maybe it's a former boss that fired you. Maybe it's your wife or husband or your children or people in relationship where there's this cyclical pattern and it keeps happening. You don't want it to happen. You recognize it. But they're kind of at the, at the point where like, well, you're that guy or that gal. Like that's just who you are. You're not going to change. You know, there's studies that have been done that say that, um, I think this is a study out of Willow Creek a long time ago, um, that basically people don't change much after they're 30. It's almost like, uh, you know, the rebar and the concrete has set and you'd have to jackhammer it out once they turn 30. People are much more flexible at a younger age. They're still learning things. They haven't made up their mind about things. And so if I'm 39, if you're beyond that, maybe you've experienced enough years of not changing to begin to let this, I don't know, numbing feeling that this is just who you're going to be for your time on earth. And so you're going to have to deal with the issues that you create in the places where you still haven't conquered your sin and conquered your fleshly desires, and, and the people around you are just going to have to deal with that too. In fact, sometimes you can justify it so much that you basically say, well, you just need to love me for who I am, you know? And uh, I'll tell you what, there's some, there some ways that I am that are not lovely, not even close. Have you ever, um, we're going to be introduced, actually not introduced, you've been being introduced for four chapters and months uh, worth of uh, basically a profile on a pride monster, Nebuchadnezzar, someone whose pride is just, you know, 
I don't know if you've ever been told by someone who made you king of anything. Imagine if you had been made king of everything by God. Now imagine all of your pride issues, whatever they are, uh, some of our pride seems uh, issues and species are a little more aggressive than others, but no matter what, if you magnify that to the point where you're in control of everything, your pride gets magnified too and you would become a pride monster and uh, do you know a pride monster? I, I know pride monsters now that are not me. I also know that I used to be a pride monster. I'm kind of glad that most of you didn't know me in college. I was just a misanthropic person, like the opposite of philanthropic. I, I would uh, think thoughts and think about doing things that were just negative and wrong. I would wake up angry. I had a general dislike for all of humanity. I remember one of the first things that happened when I just surrendered my faith and repented and really relinquished my whole life to God again is I immediately began to remember that human beings are made in God's image and they are eternal in value. And it was like a paradigm shift for me because I had decided people are not valuable unless they can do something good for me. And sounds kind of megalomaniacal. And so <coughs> I've been transformed. So transformed that I, soccer season has started and my, two of my boys are playing soccer this year and uh, the world's a small place, especially in the Portland suburbs and I will meet people that I knew in college, mothers and fathers of other boys and they'll recognize me and look at me and, and I'll be all nice and then they'll be like, oh, he's going to try to sell me something or like, who is this? Oh, maybe it's not him. It's like, how many Matisses are there? And like, well, they're just trying to figure out why is he being nice? You know, I was such a mean, angry person in the past. And, and even if I was being nice, it was probably just because I wanted something and I was trying to get something. So I've been transformed. I'm an example of a man who was very prideful, very about himself, very much uh, wanting to rule my own little dominion. And I've been changed. And at the same time, there are these crevices and cracks and chasms where I still feel parts of that pride monster alive in my heart. And you push me far enough, you get me angry enough, uh, you get me hungry or lonely or tired enough, and that ugly monster is rearing his head. And I will say things that I'm glad I don't live uh, having my entire life be filmed on a reality television show, because I'm not sure that uh, a whole lot of people would want me as their pastor if that was the case. Now, I think you can find the very same thing, that, that person inside of you. You haven't been given the whole world to reign, neither have I. I have actually not been given anything to reign, believe it or not. I don't know about you, but we all have places that we care about, and we have a sphere of influence, and we try to exert control over those areas. We try to rule what we have control over. And it doesn't always start out with some really evil scheme that you're trying to take over the world. It, it starts out with you care about this. You care about this thing, and so you want to control it. Maybe you want to control your wife or your husband, or maybe you want to control a friend, or maybe you're going to control employees or a boss who is making life difficult for you, or maybe you want to control your children. Constant temptation for me to try to control my children rather than teach them who God is. And that kind of control is a place where we become in opposition to heaven and heaven's rule. And we're going to come across a story here, an amazing story about massive transformation that happened in a tyrant. I mean, it would be like uh, if, if Stalin or Mao or, or Hitler had been transformed and all of a sudden they're genuinely worshiping God. It's, it seems impossible. How could this be true? What is going on? And, and if God can transform someone who's made king of everything and believed himself to be king of everything and did everything for his own glory, just the most temperamental, angry, burn your own friends in the fire kind of tyrant, then we really have no reason to honestly say he can't change us. So it's a very hopeful and powerful message today about God's ability to transform us, God's ability to change us, God's ability to cause us to repent to break off the sins that we have been acting in as we've taken up our own control and to take us out of a place where we're in conflict with the rule of Jesus Christ from heaven over our own little rule and rather just entrust to him the control of our lives again. And that is such a good message and it's so freeing. 
but it does mean you need to repent of your own control and rule. It means you need to break off certain sins, and some of these sins are so deeply embedded in the patterns of our life that it almost feels like we wouldn't even know who we are if we don't continue them. We wouldn't even know what would happen. And change is scary. Any kind of change is scary, but transformation? What if you let go of control over who you are and give God the power to reign in your life. How do you know what he's going to make you do? You really have to trust another person in this case. <coughs> and I would submit to you, you might not be able to ever fully entrust yourself to another human being uh, because you know they fail. Early on, I was given the advice through a mentor. It's actually advice of uh, Francis Schaeffer that he gave him. Um, and it was the number one thing that you need to know as a pastor is to let God be God and let man be man. Let human beings be human beings. In other words, God's going to be faithful and he's going to be sinless and he's going to be righteous and he's going to be good. And human beings are going to be sinful. They're going to fail you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to do wrong things. So don't be shocked by that when it happens in the church. Don't be shocked by your own sin. Let God be God and man be man. And I think about that and I think about why is it that I actually trust God enough to relinquish control over everything in my life to him. And the deepest answer I can give you is that he died for me while I was still a sinner. He died for me while I was shaking my fist at him. I felt like God was a liar. I felt like he lied to me about how good he is from a very young age, had a horrible disease, skin disease, and thought God says he loves me and God says he's my healer and I'm not healed. He must not love me. He's a liar. And there's this doubt and anger in my heart. And yet while I had that doubt and anger and while I was living my own controlling, prideful, aggressively angry, temperamental life, he died for me and he forgave me of my sin. And if he can forgive a man like me, who knows better? It's one thing that if you were, you know, had abusive parents, I had wonderful parents. I can't think of a single thing that I would be able to blame my parents for that would somehow justify what I did. They taught me well. They loved me well. They cared for me well. And yet I lived this horribly rebellious life. And so when God forgave me, when I realized that in order for him to forgive me, he would have to sacrifice his own son. When I rec recognized that Jesus willingly went to the cross, even just for my sin alone, I realized this is the only person that I know in all of existence that I can entrust with all that I am and everything that I have. And still I find myself now 39, many years after having that repentant experience, and I find areas in my life that I'm still trying to take control of, places where I'm in opposition to the rule of heaven. And I know you're no different I know we so easily, no matter how long we've been living with the Lord, we're bent in our flesh to want to seize control, and it's not good for us, it's not right for us, and God is working to help us relinquish, to cause us to relinquish that control. So it's a hopeful message today, but if you really don't believe that you can change anymore, only incrementally, and not that much, uh, it is a painful message, but what you need to do is you need to repent of trying to rule your own life, and you need to relinquish that rule and accept that heaven rules. Relinquish your own rule and accept that heaven rules. That's the main point. If a friend asks you, hey, what did you learn today? Or was it a good sermon? Uh, I can't promise that it's going to be a good sermon, but you can remember this point. I can, I can promise you that if you remember to apply this point, you will be changed. You need to relinquish your own rule and accept that heaven rules. That means breaking off sins. That means obeying those areas in your life where you know the Bible is at odds with what you've been doing. And you do that in the power of the Spirit, not in a white-knuckle way. It means when, um, when you hear about a Bible-reading challenge or when you hear about an opportunity to pray in church, you should really actually consider, you know what, is the Lord calling me to do this? He may not be calling you to do this exact Bible-reading challenge, but He has commanded that we would be reading God's Word, that our life would be marinating in God's Word and the life of our children and those that are within our sphere of influence as well. So again, if you want to be changed, if you want to be transformed, if you know you need that, you need to relinquish your own rule and accept that heaven rules. So if you've got your Bibles, turn them open to Daniel chapter 4. We're going to be in the verse, three verses to begin with here. <coughs> important to understand, and they get misunderstood, and, and understandably so. It's a natural misunderstanding, but we'll, today the entire sermon will be Daniel 4, 1 through 27, but I want you to pay special attention to verse 1 through 3. 
in order to set up one through three, we need to remember what just got done happening and even another event before that. So Nebuchadnezzar had set up a golden image uh, that I think represents not only his gods, but also his own authority. And the link to that is the fact that God said that you're the golden head and then all the other metals. There's no other king that has quite the consolidation of power and control that he has. But all of that was just going to fall to this rock that's being hurtled out of heaven that we know is Jesus Christ and, and ultimately the king of a new kingdom that will never die. So Nebuchadnezzar's been having these prideful responses to God's humbling supernatural work in his life through Daniel. And one of them was, instead of accepting that Nebuchadnezzar's life would, would ultimately mean nothing if it wasn't surrendered to Christ, he decides to make this own golden image of himself. And anybody that doesn't worship it, he's gonna burn in the fire. And in this case, uh, some of his most valuable men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, would not worship it. But turns out God made them fireproof, uh, non-combustible. And he, they saw them in there. Uh, some believe it's with Jesus himself. Some believe it's an angel. The text simply does not specify whether it's Jesus or an, an angel. But at least somebody in there who's not a human being, one of the son of the gods, is protecting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. And it deeply impacts Nebuchadnezzar. And you might think, oh, this is his moment of repentance. Because he actually says in verse 28 of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. Now, minus the fact that he hadn't really repented of his violent ways, obviously, uh, this is not real repentance. And you can know this based on the story. The story that King Nebuchadnezzar is going to tell about his own life in chapter 4 shows that he had still not accepted that heaven rules. We're going to be going through that. So if you don't know that, you might read chapter 4, 1 through 3 as sort of a continuation of the repentance that happened in Nebuchadnezzar's life as a result of seeing these men be saved from the fire. But it's not that. Let's, let's look at uh, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. You can see how easy it would be to think, oh yeah, this is him responding to the fiery furnace. He's become a changed man. He's now a godly king. That's not what's happening. This is a preamble to the letter he's about to write of how he was actually humbled. What really took place for this shocking transformation. Peace be multiplied to you. This is the guy that flies into an angry rage and wants to execute every one of his wise men. This is the guy who says, I'm going to kill you in the fire if you don't worship the image I set up. This is a man who had such a violent temper there's such a megalomaniacal attitude about himself. You'll see in, um, in next week's sermon how, how arrogant he still was. Uh, no matter how many of these supernatural visions and instances that he got to see, he still would not humble himself and recognize that it's actually God who rules from heaven and not him. But he really is a changed man here. He's not talking about Daniel's God or some other God. He's not trying to force people to worship this God. He says, it seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. He's not talking about himself anymore. He's talking about another king and another kingdom. This is Nebuchadnezzar transformed, and it might seem so obvious, but it's, it's just a little shocking to think about. You will spend eternity in heaven with Nebuchadnezzar. Have you thought about that? With a former tyrant and megalomaniac, at least one of them in history we know is going to be with us forever. He's a child of God. This is worship that shows saving faith. He's really actually repented. And I belabor that only for this reason. If God can change Nebuchadnezzar, he can change you and me. Why else would have he had Daniel, and in this case Nebuchadnezzar, record these stories in the Bible? Of all the ways that God worked towards humbling Nebuchadnezzar, ultimately we find out he humbles him by using mental illness or a psyche, uh, 
what's it called? A psychic break of some kind. Nebuchadnezzar is struck with craziness. Eats grass. And that's the, the, the severe mercy that ultimately brings the humility that is needed. God does that. Why would God show that he can do it with Nebuchadnezzar? Why would he show that if he didn't mean for us to believe that he can do it for us? So it, it's, I don't mean to be harsh, but it's not a faithful attitude to have that believe that God can't change you. You're not that unique. You're not that special. You are special. You are unique. But you're not so new, unique that God doesn't know exactly how to reach in and change your heart. And that's a good thing. Because you know the ways that you are different than Jesus have been harming you and harming others and harming your relationship to God. If he can change Nebuchadnezzar, he can change you and me. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I want to stop there. I won't go this herky-jerky through the whole story because I want to read the story and have some flow to it. But I want to mention, and this doesn't get mentioned enough, and in particular this verse, I think you could just kind of go right over it, but... Just because you're at ease and you're prospering does not mean that you're right with the Lord. It doesn't. It can feel that way. I, I like to call it the scoreboard effect. You know, um, we'd be dominating some team in high school or played at Lake Oswego High School and we were pretty pretty dominant team and Portland State wasn't quite as dominant, but sometimes we'd play other teams that were far less talented and so we would be winning, I don't know, uh, 65 to 21 or something and they'd be talking trash because they're angry and all you say is scoreboard. Look how good we're doing. And it just shuts everybody up because we're dominating. You can do that with your life. You can say, look at the scoreboard. Look how much money I have. Look at how many things I have. Look how pretty my wife or Look how good this car is that I have. This brand new Tesla I just bought. You can basically say scoreboard and see God's for me. It's easy enough to do. It's, it's, it's harder to believe that things are wrong between you and the Lord when things are going really well and you're at ease and you're prospering. At the same time, it's also not true that if you're struggling and things are difficult and there's a lot of friction and no ease and no prosperity in life that things are wrong with him. That's also not true. Turns out it's actually blessed to be persecuted, Jesus says. There are times, I know some of you actually lost your jobs during the pandemic based on some of the restrictions that butted up against convictions that you had, that you believed it was not wise to do certain things or do other things. And so you just stood on that and you lost your job, you got fired, you got pushed out. I consider that kind of thing in the realm of persecution, and that is, a, uh, for some of that of you, that caused real difficulty, uh, probably more tension in your marriage, more tension uh, financially for you, which is already so difficult, and does that mean you're wrong with God? Because, or maybe, maybe because you're right with God, and because you're actually living according to your biblical convictions and wisdom, you're experiencing that struggle and that difficulty. So sometimes you could be really, really close with God and you have lots of ease and prosperity. And other times you could be really close to God and be beheaded like John the Baptist. Being close to God is not always um, obviously shown as a sign in terms of your well-being in life, in terms of your prosperity. I will say this. In general, I think a life of obedience leads to greater prosperity and greater ease and a life of disobedience, just like we talked about in the Proverbs. It's not going to go well for you if you just constantly dismiss God's wisdom. But I did want to stop there and just say, you know, ultimately the ways that you need to change are directly in relationship to how close you are with the Lord. The farther you are away, the more your desires and affections are disordered. And the closer you are, the more aligned they are with Jesus. So that distance right here, um, that's what we're looking at. Don't allow prosperous ease to cause you to believe there isn't distance between you and the Lord. Uh, look into your spirit and ask the Lord, is there something that I've been doing, a way that I've been living, a way that I've been being that puts distance between me and you? Let's continue with the story. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. Verse 6, so I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and the chanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in and told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. <coughs> I think it's worth noting because not everybody has been studying Daniel with us and I see some of you that are new and you may not know the story of Daniel, or may not be fresh on it. Um, isn't it a little surprising that Nebuchadnezzar would do the exact same thing? Wouldn't you think he would just immediately go to Daniel 
I already know that all my enchanters and diviners and Chaldeans, they can't interpret dreams. They didn't do it last time. Daniel can, so I'll go directly to him. Why does he do the same mistake over again? It, <coughs> it almost defies reason and logic, and I think that's, that's actually true, and you can experience in your own life. Have you ever known that a certain behavior creates a certain result, and it's the opposite result that you want, and you do the same thing again anyway? I've known since the very beginning of my marriage that the only truly wrong time to resolve a long-term conflict is while that conflict is raging. Have you learned that? You don't work out conflict when you're both angry. You come back to it. I've known that. Uh, I wish it wasn't true, but I can't tell you how many times I've tried to resolve conflict while the conflict is raging anyway. It never works. It never works. There's something... <clears throat> in our flesh that would rather try the wrong thing over and over and over again with the illogical, impossible hope of it having a different result than actually just surrendering and letting God give you a new way to behave and think and act. So it's really not surprising that Nebuchadnezzar, before having repented, would just fall right back into his old ways. But not only that, he needs to know the interpretation of the dream. He's very troubled by it. He knows there's something important about this, and I need to know. So he does call Daniel, verse 8. At last, Daniel came in before me. But you can see him hedging his bets here. Just watch. He who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. Now let me just back up because Nebuchadnezzar's already heard what Daniel believes about who's giving the actual interpretation. Chapter 2 verse 27, Daniel answered to the king and said, no wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God, not gods, a God, one, in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days, your dream and your visions of your head as you lay in your bed are these. And that's the one about the, uh, the statue with the golden head. I'm going to fast forward again to chapter 4, and you see he's calling it the spirit of the holy gods. Daniel told him, it's just one God, and it's not me that's doing the interpretation, it's God. And yet, Nebuchadnezzar's still stuck on his own God, the spirit of the holy gods, and that it's Daniel that's doing the interpretation. And so you can see all the evidence that Nebuchadnezzar is not relinquishing his own control. There's so many reasons why he should. Think back to the vegetables in the water. The, one of the greatest nations that's ever existed, one of the most powerful consolidated controls of the world was ancient Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And they had these ways of developing men in education in every possible way. And they were fed from the king's table and had all these advantages. And God's like, hey, I'll give my guys vegetables and water and they'll still be 10 times better than yours. And Nebuchadnezzar sees it and he recognizes it and he still doesn't repent. He has a dream, doesn't tell them the dream or the interpretation. Only one man in the whole kingdom can tell the dream and the interpretation, and it's true. And that man, Daniel, tells him it's, there's just one God, and he still doesn't repent. And time goes on, and Nebuchadnezzar increases his own pride, makes a whole golden statue, and then tries to put to death Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who also say, even if you're going to do that, we're not going to worship you. We're only going to worship the one true God. And they trusted in God, and God saved them from the fire. I don't, can't think of a single other story where someone was in a fire, and God rescued them, and not even the hairs of their head were singed. Imagine watching that. Imagine watching something undeniable supernatural in your life, something that supernatural, and coming away from it completely unchanged. That's how pride works. It just shields us from all possible change and transformation, especially when that transformation requires humility or repentance of sin. <coughs> so that's where Nebuchadnezzar's at. And here, interestingly, it tells Daniel the dream. Verse 10, the visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to the heavens. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. There's something supernaturally large. I don't know if we have a, um, an actual visual of this or not. Um, 
I found one that I thought was really powerful. If I didn't submit it or if it's not there, don't worry about it. But uh, this is a tree. It's not possible on around earth that you'd be able to see a tree from anywhere on earth. So this is a vision of a tree so large, so dominating. It reminds me of when uh, Jesus returns, where even on around earth, every knee shall bow and every eye shall, every uh, tongue shall confess and every eye shall see that Jesus is returning. And I don't think that's just about them being on, him being on TV, but it's like you just see him. He's, I don't know if the world becomes like see-through on one side or not. We don't know. It was one of the questions the uh, doctrinal team asked themselves in um, our doctrinal study on end times. Uh, but it reminds me of that, something supernatural. It's reaching to the heavens. This is a massive tree. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts, of the, let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, and the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth, in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's. Let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by decree of the watchers and the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men in my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. This is an unchanged Nebuchadnezzar having this dream about a world tree. And although some of it seems like we can interpret it without Daniel's interpretation, Nebuchadnezzar is not aware. He's frightened. He's worried about what it might be. Deep down in his heart, there's this dread from knowing he hasn't accepted the rule of heaven, even though God has been knocking on that door for a long time. He still doesn't really know what this means. And Daniel's Response is interesting. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream of the, or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Here's what I think is happening in Daniel's heart, and I think this is in uh, concert with his character. He's dismayed. He's not scared. It doesn't say he's scared. Another man might be scared to tell Daniel, uh, to tell Nebuchadnezzar uh, the interpretation of this dream because it means, you know, God's going to cut you down because you're not humbling yourself. You don't really want to tell that to a tyrant, egomaniacal uh, king, but Daniel's not afraid of that. We're going to see just in two chapters that Daniel will go to the lion's den just over being forced not to pray. He's not going to do it. And so he's not, a, well, he might be afraid of death, but not to the point where he's going to be unfaithful. So I don't think that's really what's going on. I actually believe that Daniel had a relationship with Nebuchadnezzar and cared about him. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about the political people in power that you know that you like the least. And I wonder if you were called in your life, let's just say God put you in a setting where you became friends with them. And God was calling you to love them and to witness to them and to basically, basically deal with the fact that they're very prideful and they're making some really deep and wrong decisions and love them anyway and desire not the worst for them but the best of God for them. <coughs> desire for them not to have to experience the worst possible outcome. Desire not necessarily for them to hit rock bottom, for them to repent first. That's what I believe is happening here in, in Daniel. And maybe a way to, to think about this is uh, the fact that even before we go into the interpretation, um, and the interpretation will, will prove this true, not everything about the tree is bad. It gives shade and its fruit is abundant. There are good things about this tree. How many of you, by show of hands, have been to the Redwoods? You ever been to the Redwoods? It's amazing. I've been there twice, once as a kid, once as an adult. And I thought when I went back as an adult that it would be less majestic, but it wasn't. It was it's just amazing seeing some of these trees. And it was fun uh, watching my children's amazement at, at the giantness of these trees. And I'm not an environmentalist. 
Um, and I don't really agree with most of the diagnostic tools that environmentalists are using. So I don't even agree with what they say is the problem. I certainly don't agree with most of the solutions, if any, that I've ever heard before. Um, I'm also not a conservationist, but I find uh, that I'm thankful for some of the conservationist work that's happened in the U.S. I'm glad that uh, there are national parks <coughs> such as Yellowstone and the Redwoods. And we went to the Redwoods and we watched a, uh, a movie, a video, a documentary about how hard fought the battle was just to save some of these Redwoods. And we saw pictures of the loggers and I'm also not against logging, but there was something about chopping down so many of these 2,000 year old trees that felt tragic, that felt wrong, that didn't feel good, and I was glad that they conserved some of them. And thinking about that, the idea of this majestic 2,000 year old tree being struck down and how you kind of wish it wasn't so, this is really what's going on in Daniel's heart. He does not actually want Nebuchadnezzar to have to be struck down in this way. So he's not pandering to him. That's not like Daniel saying, oh, you know, it's some flattering thing. He's saying, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. I think he means it. So let's go on. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. Not frightening at all to say that to a tyrant. That would just boost his ego. Next part, though, is what's, what's difficult. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree from the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know heaven rules. The king of the world versus the king of heaven, and he has not repented. <coughs> Before we go and focus on Nebuchadnezzar and then think about how we're a lot like him when we try to control things in our own lives, I want to talk about something that I think is a lost art, and that is speaking the truth in love. I believe Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar, didn't want the worst of the worst to happen to Nebuchadnezzar, wasn't going to take any joy in watching Nebuchadnezzar lose his mind. And I think when you care about someone, that's actually oftentimes when it's harder to give them bad news. If you really don't like someone, you might not speak the truth in love, but you're probably not all that tempted not to speak the truth. If you really care about someone, then it's harder to actually tell them what they need to hear especially when you think the truth may separate you in relationship. And I think one of the things that I've learned is that you need to love the person more than you love the relationship. You need to love the person more than you love the relationship. If you love the relationship more than you love the person, then when it comes to telling someone some hard truth that you think will probably break the relationship, even though it shouldn't, the response breaks the relationship, or maybe you're afraid that you're going to say it wrong. And so for whatever reason, you're so afraid of losing the relationship. This happens between uh, fathers and adult sons and mothers and adult daughters and vice versa. When, you know, nobody wants to be estranged from their children. And so oftentimes parents won't speak the truth in love to their children, especially at an older age. And we're not talking about harping on things. We're talking about saying it once and then letting God work on that. Or maybe it's a friend. And maybe it's one of your only friends. And you really care about this relationship, but they're behaving in a way that you know is destructive to them and others. And you have this nagging feeling, you've got to say something. But the longer you wait and the more excuses you make, the quieter that voice gets. You can kind of sear that area so that you're no longer tender to the Lord's work in your life and you just don't speak the truth in love to them. So my advice in that case is if you really care about the person, you'll speak the truth in love. But if you care about the relationship more than the person, you may end up giving into temptation and saying nothing. And 
another thing that's true is um, I rarely make the mistake of not speaking the truth. I mostly make the mistake of not saying it in love. And here's the interesting thing. When I actually really love the person and I'm coming to them with a loving attitude, it's not the specific content of my words that matter so much. It's the whole vibe. Oh, I know this person loves me and I, and I disagree with portions of what they're saying, but at the end of the day, the, the thing that they're saying is right. I, I've become so much more effective I said that wrong. I am so much more effective when I speak the truth in love. And it's the content of the words. I work on it. I pray about it. I maybe run it by a mentor. Do you think this is the best way of saying it? But at the end of the day, love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers you stumbling over your words and not saying it right. If a person really believes you love them, they'll, um, they'll let you say some things not perfectly right. So don't use the excuse that you're not going to say it right. God got pretty upset with Moses when he said, oh, I stumble over my words, I can't be the guy. God actually got angry when Moses kept making mistakes and uh, kept m- m- mentioning his own uh, issues and problems for not being willing to be the mouthpiece of God for Israel and to, to the uh, Pharaoh of Egypt. So God will use you. He will even use your broken words, uh, but it's essential, critically important that you actually love the person when you're saying it. If you're being judgmental in your heart, uh, spirit and this power is not going to be there in your words, but you got to say it. That's somewhat of a side point because the focus here is not the fact that uh, Daniel told the truth. The focus here is the content of Daniel's words and their effect on the king. Verse 27, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed and that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Even at the very end, Daniel wants Nebuchadnezzar to repent now, to change his ways now, to be changed right now, so that he doesn't have to experience all these horrible things, so the tree doesn't have to be chopped down. There may perhaps still be a lengthening of your prosperity. You won't have to hit rock bottom. Daniel loves him. And we can see that there are specific kinds of sins in Nebuchadnezzar's life. In these verses... Uh, mercy to the press, so we can reverse engineer that one of the iniquities is that he doesn't, wasn't generous. This is a, the kind of king who measured his gold in tons, and he can't be bothered to help the poor with any of it. So there's no generosity. So we might consider in our own lives evaluating, is my generosity submitted to the rule of heaven, submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ? After what he's done for me, gave his whole own life, most valuable thing that exists in the universe, gave it for me. While I was still a sinner, and I'm, I'm supposed to become like this king. That's our reason for generosity. Not because the pastor tells you to give or because the church has needs, but because it's Christ-like to do, to be generous. Are you generous? Are you generous in particular to those who have a need? Do you turn a blind eye to those who have a need in your life? If you can't be bothered, there's something in you resisting the rule of heaven. That's one area. We don't get any other specific sins uh, from this passage, but I think you'll all agree with me that he had a terrible temper. You have anger issues? Do they pop out when you get pushed too far? Do they hurt other people and you wish they didn't? I've struggled with anger issues all my life, and they are way more under control than they, than they used to be, but I still know that when it comes down to it, I would not res- resist anywhere near the amount of a temptation that Jesus did to be angry uh, about things. Uh, as, as, as he did. I, I, I know that there's ways that the enemy could tempt me that would, uh, I think of Moses who was so humble and yet, remember he got angry and struck the rock twice and made it sound like he was the one that brought it out and he got the punishment at the end of his life not to go in the promised land. I'd like my anger to be killed so that I don't do that to, at the end of my ministry and have to have some horrible discipline, you know? I want my anger gone now. So anger is another place, especially if that anger leads to violence. And I don't want to shy away from talking about actual physical violence. If you get physically violent, whether you're a guy or a gal, this is a real problem. This is not Christ-like. But there's another way to get violent, and that's with your words. You just say horrible things to people. And maybe you say them so often, the person loves you so much that they, you know, they accept them, but, or not maybe accept them, but just sort of become numb to you saying them. It doesn't make it any less sinful doesn't make it any more out of sync with the rule of heaven. And so you can see I'm trying to use the sins that God highlighted in Nebuchadnezzar to help you evaluate because I think that's most, the most powerful thing to do. Um, another one, it's very clear, especially from the very next passage where we're not going to yet go, 
that Nebuchadnezzar was very prideful about his own intellect and ability to lead, his own skill and competence. And I think that's an area. No matter how small the thing that you're being competent over, it's good to be competent. It's great. Uh, it's so fun to work with competent people. And Boone's Ferry has a, a lot of competent leaders and people serving. Um, but no matter how small the area of competence is, it can be a real temptation of pride. I'm so competent. I'm so good at this. When it's God that gave you the gift, gave you the ability, causes your brain to continue functioning, I am so competent. Competence can be a real area of pride. Intelligence. We have some really intelligent people in our church. You probably all know who we're thinking about when we think the most intelligent people have kind of next level intelligence. When you're that intelligent, it's easy to start getting contemptuous towards people that aren't and they don't understand. Ah, oh, yeah, people are so dumb. Why won't they learn? Well, God gave you a brain that makes it so much easier for you to learn than other people. And so you may need to recognize that you're not really serving the Lord with your intellect. You know, some of the most evil things that have ever happened have been done by the most brilliant people. I think in particular biblical scholars who actually reject the authority of God's word and still point to themselves as authorities. And they use all that brilliant intellect, but they're not mastered by scripture. They're masters over it. And so they say all kinds of crooked things and wrong things. And they have not yet accepted that heaven rules. To go outside of the potential um, sins that Nebuchadnezzar clearly had a control issue you know, as a tyrant, and uh, as a mother or as a father, are you trying to control things in your family? You're hurting people because you're exerting too much control in your relationship to your children? You know, I think I probably exert at times too much control in my relationship to the children. God is so gracious. At a young age, they're so flexible. It doesn't break the relationship. But the more they become young men and young women, not plural, <laughs> only got one of them, the more they're going to dislike someone overshadowing and trying to control them. You know, so I want to let go of that now and not harm the relationship. I love my kids. I hope to have and I believe I can have good relationships to them all my life. That control will kill it. When a man or a woman is letting heaven rule, you don't control. You trust the Holy Spirit to change people. You pray for people. In the times where I'm trying to control things, I'm praying less. In the times that I'm trying to pray, I'm praying more, I control less. Now maybe You know that prayerlessness, according to Samuel, is actually a sin? Prayerlessness, just never praying, is a result of sin in our lives. It's not the kind of life that is conformed to the rule of heaven. So I hope I've given you enough kind of areas to really consider in your life where you may not be in submission to the rule of heaven. And I almost don't want to say what I'm about to say, but, but even apart from the cross, if the cross had not yet happened, if this was Nebuchadnezzar's time, God is already worthy of our submission. He's already good enough. But when we sort of half worship him, when we sort of go through the motions of worshiping him, what we're saying with our life is that he's almost worthy, almost good, almost glorious, almost righteous. You may be saying, well, I, I'm not in opposition to heaven ruling. I know they rule, but then you have this little area over here that's reducing your worship by a third or maybe only a fourth or a fifth, but it's still saying, God, you're not trustworthy enough with this piece. I'm going to rule right here. And God's gracious. God's been very patient with Nebuchadnezzar's pride monster life here, hasn't he? We're going to see that that patience runs out and that God strikes him with a psychotic break. Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's an animal, a bull or a cow or something. He starts eating grass. Does it have to take that in our life? It has for me sometimes. It's taken me making such a mess out of my life that God has to orchestrate a consequence that I cannot get out of. I told my boys that God's consequences are so much worse than spankings. You know, spanking you feel better minutes later. With God, it, it can be years of recovering from the consequences that he's brought into your life as a result of your own rule and your own resistance to the rule of heaven. But we do have the cross. And it shows that unlike every tyrant and leader and megalomaniacal king and people that act like they're good but are so evil based on the content of the policies, Jesus is not like that. There's not a single sin in him that you could point to. And so just based on that alone, he's already worthy of our whole worship, of our whole surrender, of ruling from heaven in our lives right now by his spirit. But instead he says, look, I see 
all the ways in which you're trying to control it on your own. I see your sin. I see all the ways that you resist my rule that is so much better for you. I see how many times you've experienced the destruction of your own ways and how you are so stiff-necked and you keep doing it. I see the wicked things that people have done, the crooked things, the perverse things, the really slithering kind of things. And I'm willing to die for every one of those. And then he says what? Now you have to be good enough? No. His death is for all of your sin, past, present, and future. And today, if you're feeling deeply convicted about some kind of sin that the Holy Spirit laid on your life in which you are resisting the rule of heaven, you've got the table again. Again, today, again. How many times have I been a bad dad and a bad husband? How many times have I decided Mati Gehring's control is better? It's not. It's worse. It's always, it's deadly. It's, de- it's sinful. I know. And so I want the pride monster gone. I want to break off my sins. I want to practice righteousness. I want to be generous. I want to be patient. I want to be kind. I want to be self-controlled. I want to be changed. I want to be changed. I'm a pastor. I still need to be changed, and so do you. And it'll never change this side of the, de- of, of the grave. So we might as well get used to the pain of admitting that we're sinners and that we still need the cross. Might as well get used to. Pave the tracks towards that kind of grace. Don't keep doing the same thing. I really have nothing more to say, so I'm just going to pray for you that as Chrissy comes up and leads here in worship again, that you would allow the Holy Spirit not just to knock on that door where you've been controlling things, but to open it, that you would open it from the inside. And when you come to communion, that you would be repenting of those areas that you've tried to control and made a mess of things and break off those sins that you know have nothing to do with your life in the future and nothing to do with becoming like Jesus Christ. And that maybe, maybe you would hope that you could become dramatically transformed again. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for the hope that you've poured into my heart about how I could change and become more like you, Jesus. I also have hope for this congregation that I believe comes from you, Lord. I pray that you would change us dramatically. And Lord, we will not begrudge you incremental change either. That's sometimes the way that you want to work, but I pray that you would change us. Lord, I actually believe that the humility and the surrender that we offer you is actually just your work too. You unlock us to do that. I pray that you would. I pray that for those who just still feel so hopeless about changing, who have so much evidence that they can't, that you would supernaturally break through and that they would come on bended knee relinquishing their own control and that our worship now would be a worship that's just filled with our desire for things in our hearts and on earth to be like they are in your kingdom in heaven. Amen.